Welcome to Emergency Chaos, where we provide tips and tricks to make you a better ear nurse. Today, we will be going over atrial fibrillation with a rapid ventricular response. We'll quickly talk about what it is and how to recognize it on an ECG. Then we'll spend more time going over the different treatment methods commonly used in the emergency department. So atrial fibrillation is the most common arrhythmia that you're going to see in the ER. Essentially, the atria contract irregularly and the issue is that if this occurs too rapidly, more signals get sent down to the ventricles, leading to an increase in ventricular contractions. Since most of ventricular filling is passive, a very fast heart rate prevents the ventricles from filling up with the adequate amounts of blood. So then, less blood is sent to the body with each contraction. Your patient will then present with hypotension, palpitations, chest discomfort, fatigue, shortness of breath, dizziness, amongst other symptoms. The main complications include the patient becoming very hemodynamically unstable, cardiomyopathy, and blood clots that form in the atria, which can ultimately lead to strokes. On an ECG, the classic characteristics of atrial fibrillation include no clear P waves as the atria are fibrillating, irregularly irregular ventricular contractions, in other words, irregular timing of each QRX X complex, and you're going to see on the cardiac monitor that the heart rate will jump often. For example, it will go from 110 to 130, then to 115, then up to 135, and so forth. You're going to see on the cardiac monitor that the heart rate jumps up and down, jumps up and down, and that's a key uh, telltale sign that this might be AFib. Here, we can see that there are no clear P waves and the QRRS complexes are irregular. For example, this one here is short, this one is long, this one is a little shorter and then kind of average, but there's no, there's no regular QRS rhythm, right? The length from one to another is irregular, which is why they're said to be irregularly irregular because one's short, one's long, and then you don't see any P waves. So that's how you can tell that uh, the patient is an AFib. Here's another example. There's no clear P waves and the distance between the QRSs or each contraction is not regular. It changes from B to B. And then here is one more example. No clear P waves and the distance is uh, changing every single time from uh, QRS to QRS. So the contractions from the ventricles are not regular. When thinking about your patient with atrial fibrillation with a rapid ventricular response, you need to ask yourself if your patient is unstable from solely atrial fibrillation or is there more to the picture that can be the cause of the patient's instability. Some of these causes can be sepsis as the heart rate will go up as a compensatory mechanism. Other causes include ACS, thyroid issues, a pulmonary embolism, and there's many more that you're going to learn as you go and you gain experience, but we'll cover those for now. So treatment will start with addressing the underlying issue if it's present. For example, as we just discussed, if your patient is septic, fluids and appropriate treatments are needed, and these will ultimately help with the AFib RVR. However, as I said, sometimes it's going to be a mixture of the underlying condition plus AFib on top of it. So the underlying issue should be addressed first to see what kind of effect it has on your patient. Now, for as far as treatment for AFib RVR, there's two methods, either rate control or rhythm control. Let's first start by talking about rhythm control, meaning you are trying to convert the patient back to sinus rhythm. The main way of doing this is through cardioversion. And more, most sources say that if a patient is very unstable, cardioversion should be attempted. However, in the real world, it's a little different, right? There's an understanding that for patients with chronic atrial fibrillation, cardioversion rarely works. And if you're going to cardiovert, the AFib has to either be new onset within 48 hours or the patient needs to be on an anticoagulation with a therapeutic INR. This is because of the risks related to blood clots in the, area, in the atria, which could cause a stroke if dislodged. A transesophageal echocardium could be performed to assess for the presence of a blood clot prior to cardioversion, but in a crashing patient, there is seldom any time to do this. Your patient, 
if it does come down to getting cardioverted without having the appropriate blood thinners on board it can also be started on a heparin drip right after so let's say you do have you guys end up doing cardioverting and your patient is not on anticoagulations even though it shouldn't happen if it does you have to bug the providers so that the patient gets started on a heparin drip as soon as possible and then if for whatever reason your provider wants to go down the rhythm control route and wants to use a medication typically procainamide is going to be used but there's other agents like ibutilide and uh, i forget the other name i think it was flecainamide uh, but procainamide is going to be the main one used for um, rhythm control if they're going to use to if they're going to if they're going to chemically convert the patient now in the er ray control is going to be what's usually done essentially ray control is just giving medications that slow the conduction through the av node and ultimately decrease the heart rate when this is done typically you will aim to obtain a heart rate around the 110s but even anything in the 130s is okay if it's accompanied by hemodynamic stability right so keeping considerations like heart failure in mind providers will often choose to start with the fluid bolus prior to targeted afib medications if the heart rate responds to the bolus it can let you know that perhaps your patient needs more proper fluid resuscitation prior to giving afib medications and fluids can also help maintain your patient's blood pressure if they are unstable with a low bp a quick side note what if your patient's bp was in the dumps and they needed a touch of a push dose vasopressor which would they choose and why so ideally phenylephrine because it has pure alpha effects only affecting svr and increasing bp not increasing the heart rate as well what about a vasopressor drip which one would they go if they needed to start a vasopressor here if you want to learn more about vasopressors i'm going to tag the my vasopressors lesson here okay and then keep going on with uh, afib rvr once the blood pressure is under control Providers will either go with diltiazem, a calcium channel blocker, or metoprolol, a beta blocker. Both of these medications will slow conduction through the AV node. Typically, I see providers choose uh, diltiazem or its brand name cardizem over metoprolol. At least in my perspective, it seems to work a little better. For cardizem, you'll most likely give 20 milligrams slow IV followed by 30 milligrams PO for longer control. If you want to learn more about cardizem, I'll tag my lesson on cardizem here. And then for metoprolol, you're gonna give somewhere between 2.5 to 5 milligrams slow IV up to 50 milligrams. I want to include Esmolol here, a beta blocker, because it can sometimes be ordered as a drip since it has a short half-life, meaning its effects will wear off quickly even after it's turned off which is why it's used at times to see if the patient can tolerate a beta blocker. And if they can't, no harm, no foul, since the effects will wear off quickly. Now, let's say the cardizem and the metropolot did not work, and the patient is still in AFib RVR. The next medication that can be given is amiodarone. You'll most likely give 150 mil, uh, milligrams IV as a bolus over 10 to 15 minutes, then followed by a continuous drip. Besides amiodarone, magnesium can also be given as it, in a sense, can have calming effects on the heart with usually 2 to 4 grams over 30 minutes. By this point, however, if the patient is still unstable or there's any doubt, your provider, your ER provider should have contacted cardiology. Another treatment option that I've seen in the past on top of everything we just mentioned is giving very, very slow pushes, even up to 15 minutes slow of digoxin. But digoxin can take up to eight hours for it to start working. So, as I said, by this point, cardiology should have gotten involved. So, specific nursing. As always, with any unstable patient, especially one that is crashing, you need to have the crash cart handy and even the pads in place in case the patient codes. Besides this, as I always preach, have your rooms ready to go. Your suction and your bag valve mask, as well as all supplies needed in critical situations. With AFib specifically, you want to get an ECG as soon as possible and multiple IVs because you'll be giving different medications simultaneously. You have to cycle your, blood, your patient's blood pressure often, especially if they are super critical and unstable. And then, most importantly, you don't slam any of the medications that we talked about. The only time you ever fast push any medications is in coast when the patient does not have a heart rate 
does not have a beating heart and is not breathing, that's going to be the only time you're ever doing fast push medications. And then most importantly, to stay safe if you don't know something, you ask. But then to quickly summarize with AFib RVR, you're going to treat the underlying issue of its present, keeping uh, considerations like heart failure in mind. You'll give some fluid, stabilize the blood pressure. Um, if you have to use pressors, you use pressors and providers will either go with Cardizem or metroprolol with most ER providers choosing Cardizem since it tends to work a little better. If that doesn't work, they will most likely go over to amiodarone and then magnesium. And then ultimately, once cardiology gets involved, other treatment methods will be employed, which can include something like digoxin, right? Now, let's go into the question of the day. So, what is the goal blood pressure for a patient who has an intracranial hemorrhage? And then for the second question of the day, what medications are typically used to control the blood pressure of a patient with an intracranial hemorrhage? And then as always, uh, th the answer to this will be at the bottom of the description text. I think that being a good ER nurse depends a lot on your experiences and taking the time to look up and familiarize yourself with topics that you don't fully understand. I've listed my favorite ER nursing related books in the description, and I believe that you can greatly benefit from reading them. Always, always, always keep learning. You'll be a better nurse, you'll be safer, and ultimately you'll be able to save more lives. If you enjoyed and learned something from the content today, I would really appreciate a like and a follow. If anything comes to mind that you would like me to cover, please comment below. And if you want to further support, I have stickers and shirts up on Redbubble for ER nurses. Check them out if you get the chance. As always, here at Emergency Chaos, teamwork makes the dream work, and we are proactive. We are not reactive. Thank you for your time today.